already a member. I told her. I told her. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, what a week. Oh, oh, I got a bunch yesterday, so you might be getting calling I was done. I was a pilot in the United States Army. I was born in Manchester in 1909, and my father, Alfonsi, was a well known West Side contractor who loved horse racing. I attended heavy school at St. Marie's West High and the University of New Hampshire. At West High, I was distinguished in my studies and won letters in football, baseball, and basketball. At UNH, I was an outstanding athlete, earning three boxing letters. After my graduation in 1930, I attended graduate school for a year and became assistant boxing coach. In 1931, I went to Kelly Field, Texas for a course in aviation. My commission came because of my extra military training at UNH and Camp Devens in Massachusetts. On February 1934, a mail plane I was piloting crashed near Salt Lake City, Utah. My body was brought back to Manchester for a full military funeral held at St. Marie's Church. On June 7, 1927, the Board of Mayor and Aldermen approved spending $15,000 to begin development of a Manchester airport. The board was no doubt influenced by the words of renowned airfield construction expert Carl Kenningston, who had told them, you have the best natural site for an airport in New England, bar none. The airport continued to grow, and 15 years later, two names were submitted to the United States government to rename the Manchester Air Base. The two entries were former Mayor Arthur E. Morrow and Jean B. Grenier. On January 22, 1942, I was honored by having the new air base dedicated as Grenier Field. Bell over here. Oh. It is a long walk, isn't it? <laughs> Welcome. I'll speak up. Is just raise your hand if you can't hear me. There's a lot of traffic on the road. I'll do my best. Welcome Thanks. to the final resting place of Arthur. E. Moreau. You notice this is his grave marking here. There's only one name on this stone. All the family is all listed down here. I tried to clean it up as best I could so that you could see the names. I was the son of Joseph and followed in my father's footsteps in the hardware business. I attended the old St. Marie's College in Central High School leaving to attend Hesser Business College. I entered full-time into my father's store in 1904. And in June of 1905, I introduced the first installment sale in the history of the Moreau store. I sold a stove on agreement of $10 down payment and $12 weekly installments. Remember, that was 1904. By 1905. And in 1915, I purchased my father's share of the business. In 1926, I was inaugurated as mayor of Manchester. During my first term, the athletic field, now Gill Stadium, was bought from the Amistad Manufacturing Company. Manchester Airport began to be developed, and in July of 1929, I became the first mayor of the city to fly in an airplane. I know, I know you're all jealous. <laughs> so were they. I organized the first industrial committee to interest new firms to come to Manchester, as well as the first traffic lights in our city. So you can thank me for the traffic lights. I am also credited with being the man who would lead in the Queen City's darkest hour. I would not let Manchester die when the Amistad Manufacturing Company liquidated in 1936. 
I propose the forming of Amiskeg Industries to purchase the mill properties and the leasing of and the sale of the mills to new industries, which would guarantee jobs and payroll to the citizens of Manchester. You can imagine the people after the mills had closed their doors and were liquidating. They must have been frightened, but Arthur stepped up. I was considered to be the savior of Manchester. And in July of 1930, the mayor, Moreau March, a song dedicated to, in my honor, was played for the first time. I was honored to lead Manchester in such a difficult time and pleased that my efforts and vision helped shape Manchester into the great city it is today. Thank you. Quite a man. I had learned, I had learned recently that uh, his name was one of two submitted for the airport's name. One was Arthur Moreau. The other was Lieutenant Jean Grenier. You might have met him already. We know how that turned out. But it's quite an honor, and especially for Mr. Moreau, it speaks a lot. Thank you. My feet hurt and they keep sinking in, but the only hard stones are over there and I don't want to step on those. So I just slowly sink in. <laughs> well, hello. I am Miss Sophie Lambert Frankier, wife of George Frankier and president of the Lambert Funeral Home in Manchester. I was born in Masonville, Quebec, the daughter of John and Lucy Lambert Roy. In 1895, my family moved to Manchester where I attended Academy of Notre Dame of St. August Parish, and then attended and graduated Academy of Notre Dame of Quebec. I married Benjamin C. Lambert, and together we founded the Lambert Funeral Home. Benjamin was born in Lewiston, Maine. He was educated at the Christian Brothers College in Amawak, New York, and was graduate of Manhattan College in 1901. His first profession was teaching school in Providence, Rhode Island for four years. He came to Manchester in 1905 and served his apprenticeship in the undertaking business. In 1914, he purchased the Gavois Funeral Home. I joined my husband in the business and, after Benjamin's death in 1946, I became one of the first lady embalmers in the country. I was very active in my community as a parishioner of St. George's Church and a membership of the Solidarity of St. Anne. I was also a member of the Third Order of St. Francis of St. Marie Parish and past president of ACA Villa Marie Antoinette, during which time I organized the first girl tree team drill in the Manchester area. I was the only remaining active charter member of the Davignon Snowshoe Club where I gained the nickname Mother of Snowshoes. Other favorite clubs included the Joilette Ladies Club, Notre Dame Hospital Associates, Catholic War Veterans, Roger Bernard Post Auxiliary, William Joat's Post, Francis American Legion Post 9 Auxiliary, National Funeral Directors Association, Le Artisan, Women's Catholic Origin of Foresters. I was a very busy woman. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Usually I would ask if there's any questions at this time, but unfortunately there is very little information on her. But from what I did found, she is an amazing woman. She, yeah. She had a full life? What was that? She had a very full life. Very full life. She did a lot. She lived to be 81, I believe. Um, and I believe being in the embalming and funeral profession, I think I, I would think, I should say, that that would make her really want to be involved in the community and I think that that's why she was so involved and she seemed to be a very caring person that gave a lot to others. It's very hard to find things on the internet about her and there's only one picture. One picture. That's my fear when I die. There will only be one picture of me. It's 
Not really. Unfortunately, the women did not get most of the attention. Exactly. We were talking about that in the past group, that there is much more information on husbands and brothers and fathers, but women, not so much. We're very lucky to be born in a time where men and women are spoken equally about on the internet. <laughs> bringing some bakery products, but then because of the pandemic, like I said, handing out food is really not a good idea. Fair enough. Anyway, good morning. Good morning. Isn't this beautiful New England it fall day? Beautiful. This is the best time of year. You know, I was looking around at my neighbors, and even though it wasn't intended, we are social distanced. <laughs> my name is Amy Norman, and I was the founder of Norman Brothers Bakery. I was born in St. Marie de Beauce, province of Quebec, and immigrated in 1887 to Manchester finding employment in the Amiskeg Mills, right along the Merrimack River here in Manchester. But it was in 1889 that I found my true calling when I went to work at the Mary Al Boussier Bakery and Grocery at 309 Pine Street in Manchester. In 1901, I decided to enter business for myself and taking my brother George as a partner, I began the Norman Brothers Bakery Company. We were on the first floor of a tenement building at 13 Laval Street. In 1911, I combined my business with another brother, Leonce, who had bought out the A&L Caron Bakery. In 1912, we built a two-story wooden building right next door to the 13 Laval Street business. Delivery of our delicious bread was by six horse-drawn wagons at that time. We continued to expand our business and in 1912 purchased the Amity Thibodeau Bakery at 29 Pearl Street, giving us the rights to the well-known Edgeworth and Buttermut bread labels. Shortly after, we were able to purchase our first motorized delivery vehicle. You may remember some of our popular brands, Bambi or Best American Bread Yet, as well as Twist and Donald Duck Bread. <laughs> Construction of our new bakery in Laval Street, designed by the architect J. N. Gerton, was completed in 1934 and remained our home until we closed our business in 1962. In 1940, I was proud that my sons Silvio and Raul started the SNR Baking Company, using the first name of each partner to produce SNR bread. I thank you for coming by to visit today. And I can take some questions, limited questions, as long as you don't say them in French. <laughs> Do uh, you look? You all look too young to probably remember Norman Brothers Bakery or SNR Bakery. Yes, they were gone by 1970. Actually, the uh, the small bakeries they they they're pretty much all gone now. They just can't compete. And you got market basket with the in-store bakery and stuff like that the small bakery just can't compete with that which is unfortunate because I mean I remember growing up and uh, we had a sunbeam bakery in my hometown which they had one here too yeah and uh, the thrill of, you know each month once or twice on a Saturday my father would take me down to the sunbeam bakery and we get the Italian bread coming right out of the oven I remember playing playground at St. Anthony school and you could smell the bread yeah yeah half the loaf would be home, gone before we got home but you know you didn't even need butter it tasted so good but you just don't have that anymore unfortunately and a lot of the ethnic breads the rye the honey, and stuff like that there's no small bakeries for that anymore they pretty much have to buy it There was a lot of, I mean, there, when you think about it, each community had their own bakery to, to serve that community because it, it, they would do the breads that were for that community, Italian or French or German. I mean, there's no German bakeries left yeah. around either. They did not have the supermarket as we know it no. today. They had the meat no. market. In it, the uh, uh, like uh, Norman Brothers delivered bread to some of the supermarkets or, or the variety stores, whatever you wanted to call them back then. They really weren't supermarkets. And I, I, I have to admit, I've seen pictures of Donald Duck bread, but I've never actually... I, I think I've heard of it recently. Yeah. I've, I've never seen it in real life. I, it's long gone now. <laughs> it just, I find it rather humorous that you name bread Donald Duck bread. It's all marketing. Yeah. You want those <laughs> Back kids then, to yeah. be eating your bread, and mom's going to buy it for them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess it's like the Wonder Bread, you know, which is, you know, was, was touted as being good for you, but it's really not that good for you. But. I like it. <laughs> 
I am Reverend Alfie LeClaire, and in 1914, I was the founding pastor of St. John the Baptist Church. I was born in Quebec, and coming to Manchester at a young age, I studied at St. Augustine Grammar School and for the priesthood at Grand Seminary in Montreal. My first assignment from 1902 to 1909 at St. George Church here in Manchester. I later served at St. John the Baptist from 1914 until 1921, at which time I became the pastor at St. Marie's Church. One of my principal achievements during my stay at St. Marie's was the development of Mount Calvary Cemetery into one of the finest Catholic cemeteries in New England. I directed many improvements to the Hebe and Holy Angel School at St. Marie's, and on the occasion of the parish's 50th anniversary, I had the interior of the church renovated. My devotion to the poor and needy of the parish were well known. Although I never liked to talk about it publicly, many a West Side merchant could tell you of a note I had written for the benefit of a needy family. I never sought much for myself and never had an automobile until 1927 when a parishioner gave me one on my silver anniversary of priesthood. I enjoyed my daily walks to the cemetery and I'm happy to be in a final resting place in a crypt under this very altar. Notice my beautiful medallion that was executed by Francois Trudel Boucher, niece of Mayor Trudel and student of Lucien Gosselin. And the medallion is over here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And that translation is, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will forever live. And there's a medallion on this side too of another priest. And from what I understand, they do a memorial service here um, as a real, like a mass. And this area is all priests that are all buried on the, on the outskirts of this little, yeah. I'm so glad you came to visit me. My name is Theodore Huto Trudel, and I was born in 1871 and passed away in 1937. I'm here to tell you my story, but I'm afraid coming back from the dead has affected my memory, so I'm going to need to refer to some notes. I hope you'll forgive me. I don't want to give you any bad information. <laughs> As I said, I am Mrs. Theodore Trudell, and uh, my husband, George E. Trudell, was the proprietor of a wholesale plumbing supplies company which bears his name. Perhaps you've heard of it. <laughs> Um, he also played a pivotal role in the civic and political life of the city of Manchester. George proudly served Manchester as its chief executive for two terms, as I served as its first lady. I was born in Joliet, Quebec, but came here to live with my family when I was still a very young girl. I have resided in Manchester ever since. I was an attendant of St. George's Church, where I also served in the St. Anne's maternity. I also enjoyed my time as, as an auxiliary at the Club Juliet. Now, my husband, George, was mayor of Manchester from 1922 to 1925. <laughs> he considered his greatest accomplishment to be the building of the Queen City Bridge and the naming of it. As my dear husband put it, Manchester's the Queen City of New Hampshire and I believe it would be a fitting name for a bridge. <laughs> Another accomplishment of which he was very proud was the building of an elevator at City Hall. As George put it, the citizens of Manchester should not be forced to climb flights of stairs. He was so considerate. <laughs> at his death in 1947, George's will specified a sum of money and our beautiful home facing Stark Park at 657 North River Road to be left to the Roman Catholic Bishop of Manchester. 
The home was called Beau Sejour. The bishop lives in that home today. I can only say that I'm glad I preceded my husband in death or I might have ended up in the street. <laughs> now, you've been such a lovely audience listening to my story. I feel obliged to share one that we tend to keep within the family. So if you would please keep it confidential, yes? Well, I have to say my husband George suffered from a number of physical ailments, the chief of which was diabetes. Later in his life, he was obliged to lose his left leg. Now, upon consulting with a psychic, oh, perhaps I should mention that my husband was a firm believer in spiritualism, mysticism, the afterlife. And he consulted with a physician or a psychic at the time of his amputation. And it was suggested that he have the amputated limb buried so that in the afterlife, he may be reunited with it. Well, George did the recommended thing and he had the, the limb buried here at the family plot in Mount Calvary. Unfortunately, following the internment, George suffered excruciating pain in his missing leg. It was so severe, he, he reached out once more to the psychic for advice what to do. It, she asked him, in what position was the leg buried? Well, it was buried in a horizontal position. <gasps> ah, she said, that is the problem. You must bury the amputated leg in the position of a standing man. Well, George did as was recommended, and the leg in its little baby casket was exhumed and reburied in a vertical position. Thereafter, George never suffered pain from what is now known as phantom leg syndrome. Thank you so much for your time. I would like to point out something. We have George, my husband George, marker here. This is the family plot. Florence was our son, born in 1904 and passed away in 1909 at the age of five. And then there's mine, Theodora. There is no marker for the leg. <laughs> I hope it's over there with George too. I'm right there. <laughs> Did you have any questions? Do they have other children? Do you know? I do not recall any other children. I, like I said, my memory isn't what it used to be. <laughs> Family relations are not on, on the other side are not exactly the same as they are here. No one has come to me <laughs> claiming heritage. Although I did speak with a gentleman a moment ago who told me that. His great-grandfather was buried here, and his name was George, and he also had a limb, amputated limb, buried with him. And I asked if he weren't sure, if he was sure he wasn't my great-grandson, but he said no. So I suppose it was rather common at the time, to, especially for Roman Catholics, to bury severed limbs. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Please feel free to check out the marker and other markers. <laughs> oh, très bien, très bien. Oh, so I should probably... Are you recording right now? Oui, oui. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, wait, there's one more over here. Come, come. Sorry. That's all right. Bonjour. Quel okay. bel matinée, oui. Such a beautiful morning. I say, uh, je m'appelle Eric Bourgeois. Uh, for those of you who do not speak French, uh, my name is Eric and I lie here with my wife, my lovely wife, Lucie Lavadieu. Uh, for many years we were married and I love her very, very much. Okay. I was born in 1874 up in Waterloo, Quebec. Not the Waterloo that your, your Abba sings about. <laughs> it's the other one, the other Waterloo. And uh, I emigrated here to Manchester in my 20s. Uh, photographer by profession. Here's one of my, my cameras right here. I dreamed of establishing a studio here and I had the ability to parle in, uh, en français and English, so fluently in both languages, so it helped me to establish a business easily among Manchester's diverse ethnic population. Uh, I secured employment with the uh, Jean B. Verrick company, 
as a photographer after I persuaded them that I would be a valuable asset to their business. Uh, I spent much of my free time recording Manchester street scenes for postcards. They were very popular. Everybody was purchasing my postcards. Uh, and you could see me riding my bicycle, uh, transporting my camera and my tripod and the uh, holders necessary for producing images on the, uh, the five by seven say, uh, glass plate negatives to make the postcards. Uh, a week's work for me included taking aerial views and buildings, interiors, and portraits of politicians and clergymen and businessmen and families, as well as special events such as parades and dedications and weddings. It was a, I was a wedding photographer. <laughs> They're very popular nowadays, I, I understand. When I photographed in Halley's Comet in 1910, you know Halley's Comet up in the sky? The Manchester Mirror newspaper said of me, and I quote, this is him saying and not me, his new stunt with the camera places him far and away ahead of many amateurs and professional photographers for enterprise and ingenuity. Many men who are considered the greatest of experts with the lenses have watched and waited in vain. Monsieur Bourgeois from a housetop, my housetop, uh, obtained a picture which is remarkable for its absolute clearness of detail and accuracy. They said that about my photo. You can clap at that. <laughs> yes, very good, very good. And uh, I became equally known for befriending the, uh, the hermit of Mosquito Pond. Uh, you all know about that, uh, Monsieur yep. Charles Lambert. Uh, Monsieur Lambert had become a hermit for many years near Crystal Lake when on a Sunday afternoon in 1900, I, I discovered him while I was photographing nature. The hermit in his lifetime, he was not the friendliest of people. No, 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 not friendly at all. And he avoided all contact with the outside world. However, you could see him once in a while bring his plants to sell to the druggist at the corner of uh, Elm and Merrimack streets to the drugstore that was there to make the drugs. Uh, I made over 150 images that beautifully documented every aspect of Monsieur Lambert's life. Uh, the man who had shunned society for over 50 years was now a celebrity due to all the photographs I took of him. In addition to my passion for photography, I was also an expert woodcarver. Some of my work includes the wood carving of Charles, and uh, Charles, he was a dear friend of mine, dear, dear friend. Uh, and I was honored to serve as a pallbearer for him upon his death in 1914. Uh, I passed away in 1863, and my dear, dear beloved wife, Lucy, she passed away in 1950. So I miss her too. Uh, another very important photograph that I took was of the Rousseau Japanese Peace Treaty that was signed in 1904 here in New Hampshire. It was very popular. You can clap at that one. Also. Very good, very good. Uh, so, uh, another interesting thing, if you want to know, is that if you drive past 188 Walnut Street, you can see my house. That's where I live, 188 Walnut Street. And uh, this, is, this is a picture of me. I'm more handsome at this age than, uh, than what is here. And there's a photo mm -hmm. of him. You can also see a life-size photograph of me at uh, the Manchester Historic Association, the Mill Yard, if you see. Okay? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, any questions? It's a beautiful day right here, no? Yeah. Yeah. So that is all. Uh, you have yourself a beautiful day. Au revoir. Au revoir. And you are off to the next one over there. Merci. Merci. Très bien. Au revoir. Au revoir. Good, good. Good to see you. Small group this time. Yeah. Very well. Byron, our son of Theophile Byron. You see a dedication to my father here. This is our family plot where both of my parents, myself, my wife, our son, and his wife are all married. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. I graduated from Laval University in 1895 with honors and Tufts School of Dentistry in 1901. I practiced dentistry here in the Notre Dame section of Manchester for many, many years, where I was also a lifelong resident. 
is very civic minded, serving as a member of the Manchester Country Club, Elks and Joliet Clubs, and as president of the Circle National Club. As an alderman, I led the successful fight in 1914 to build the Kelly Falls Bridge. And later in June of 1951, Alderman Roger E. Brassard introduced the following motion at a me meeting of the Board of Mayor and Aldermen. <clears throat> Inasmuch as Dr. Byron has contributed largely to the construction of the bridge, the people of Notre Dame feel it would be most befitting to pay the deserved tribute to Dr. Byron by changing the name of the Kelly Falls Bridge to the Nazaire E. Byron Bridge. So this was done. In the petition for the bridge name change, the section of West Manchester called Notre Dame was mentioned. Its boundaries were probably best summed up in an article on Franco-American history that appeared in the New Hampshire Sunday newspaper dated December 9, 1951 find the Notre Dame area as west of the river and north of Sullivan Street. Byron Street in Bernardville is also named in my honor. If you have any other questions about my family, you can see our names and dates of birth and death on the back of our lovely family headstone. And this small stone here is a dedication to our son Paul, who was a medic in the Army, Lieutenant Colonel in World War II, and also a private practice doctor here in the Manchester area. from our dates of birth and death that we were all fortunate enough to live good long lives. I imagine our medical practices contributed largely to that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is William H. Jutras, and although I'm not actually buried here at Mount Calvary, uh, this beautiful monument was erected in my honor after I was killed in action at the St. Mihail sector. I was an officer in the Lafayette Guards, Yankee Division. I volunteered to carry a warning to my platoon in an attempt to keep them from being ambushed by German machine gun nests lying in wait. I succeeded and kept my platoon from annihilation. I was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross posthumous, uh, posthumously, and Jutris Post 43 by the American Legion was named in my honor. A graveside ceremony is held each year, and a mass is said at the St. Augustine Jutris Post Memorial Monument. Lucian Goslin is the name of the sculptor, and Manchester artist Omer Lasonde was the technical advisor for the Jutris Post Memorial Monument. The decision to use Goslin was made after viewing a model submitted by him, and he had just recently completed the Pulaski Equestrian Monument at Pulaski National Park. The memorial is made of New Hampshire granite, a soldier cast in bronze, a tall cross flanked by two, uh, by two pillars on either side. It is 15 feet tall and four feet wide. It was constructed by the Federal Art Project of the Works Progress Administration and sponsored by the Jutras Post Number 43. The total cost was about $10,000. 7,000 of that amount coming from the WPA, and the remaining 3,000 raised by subscription from the Jutras Post. The memorial was dedicated on Sunday, October 8, 1939, with over 5,000 people in attendance. And I am honored to be included in this beautiful monument that was erected as a tribute to the memories of Manchester's veterans that you see in this plot around us here today. So, uh, Jutras, he is buried in Manchester. He's buried, his, uh, he's got his, mam his family has a small family plot. It's by St. By St. Augustine, I believe it's like by Beach, Beach Street. Street. By that, yep. yeah, so he's buried with his family around there. But I like to think that if he had a say where he'd be buried, he'd be buried by his, by his brothers I think he lost a brother too at the same time yeah. in the service. So uh, you guys are more than welcome to take a look at some of these. They're mostly World War One, but there are a few World War Two inscriptions as well. Uh, you're more than welcome. If you have any questions for me, I can try to answer them to the best of my ability. Or just, uh,
much for being here today. I hope you're enjoying your visit so far. Absolutely, thank you. Sorry, it was tough to find you. <laughs> My name is Lucian Gosselin, born in 1883 in Whitefield, New Hampshire, died in 1940. Mm -hmm. My father was of French ancestry, first settling in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and then eventually making his way to New Hampshire. My mother was a, uh, from a family of sculptors. The most prominent was Philip Hebert of Montreal, and his works can be found throughout Montreal, Quebec, and Ontario. As a small boy, I attended St. Augustine's Academy. By 1909, without ever taking a lesson, I had completed a bust of Napoleon Bonaparte as my first work. My second work was of my uncle, Philip Hebert, and my third, a statuette of Abraham Lincoln. In 1911, I enrolled in l'Académie Julienne, Paris, France, where I studied for two years, winning a gold medal in competition. I returned to Manchester in 1916, building my own studio, executing numerous statues and medallions of prominent Franco-Americans from New York and New England. Among some of the outstanding monuments in Manchester that I have completed, the World War Memorial in Victory Park, Sweeney Memorial, Jutra's Post Memorial, Pulaski Memorial, which has recently been renovated, and please take the time to see it if you haven't. The marble statues at St. Joseph's Chapel, the Alfred J. Chrétien Memorial and, and T.J. Lebrecht Memorials here in Mount Calvary Cemetery, amongst about nine or ten works that I did in the cemetery here, and the busts of Bishop Girton, Dr. Auguste Brienne, and Franklin Pierce. I also executed large panels of relief or plaques, including those at St. Joseph Grammar School, St. Anthony School, soldiers killed in World War I, members of ACA, and Reverend Louis Ramsey, chaplain of Judas Priest. Judas Post. <laughs> but alas, my greatest works were never to be, because the funding fell short. One was the $50,000 war memorial of Joan of Arc in Lafayette Park, opposite St. Marie Church and facing the city. It was to measure 72 feet in length at the base, with seven steps to the first platform, where there would be a floor 11 feet deep, the entire 72 feet of the monument. This floor leads to a second series of steps, 14 in number, broken in the center by a high pedestal, 16 feet tall. On top of this is the equestrian statue of Joan of Arc in bronze, 18 feet from the base to the top of the helmet, another foot tall with the sword raised above its head. In all, the monument was to be 42 feet tall. There were to be numerous plaques throughout the memorial and an American eagle surmounting the front with a fountain. The second work that never came to be was a colossal eagle on top of rock rimmen. This was to measure 10 feet in diameter on a pedestal 20 feet high. The eagle itself would measure 12 feet from claws to bill and the tip of its outstretched wings 18 feet in length. This great bird passed over a series of esplanades and stair approaches and would be vi visible for miles when illuminated at night. It was my honor to create a legacy for myself paying tribute to these important people here in the city and beyond through the love of my art. Though I was unable to complete everything, still a great body of work, 10 of which is in this cemetery alone. Thank you very much for your time. Please feel free to take a look at the headstone, which starts with his parents, actually. the works were not completed? Was it due to death? Was it due to funding? That was funding. Not funding. Yeah. Right. yeah, there were funding challenges. I wasn't able to raise the $50,000 for the Joan of Arc monument. Uh, Back then, that was... Yes. If we do the calculation, that would have been, you know, at, maybe that is an extra zero. So yeah. it's quite, yeah. quite costly. Uh, and he didn't have the funding to do it himself. But I guess there is a, a, a draft version of the Eagle but it's not available for public view. Mm. Apparently it was quite outstanding and a uh, great demonstration of strength. Uh, unfortunate that he wasn't able to complete it. With all the work you created, did you leave at least leave a, live a happy life at all? <laughs> well, I was married a few times. <laughs> and I had a good time in Paris. Okay. And yeah. certainly uh, loved Manchester and New Hampshire very much and then yeah. did all this work for New York and around New England but always came back to the city here. Yeah.
point, we'll probably be able to uh, 